This is the small town of Aztec, New Mexico, located about two and a half hours northwest of Albuquerque, depending upon how fast you drive along the often deserted highway. It's close to the Four Corners area, that geographic landmark where the states of Utah, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico intersect one another. Like most places, it has a story to tell. With Aztec, however, that story goes far beyond the norm. You might even say that the Aztec story is truly out of this world. off to New Mexico to visit the site of an alleged flying saucer crash, that friend would probably assume you were headed to Roswell. For the past three decades or so, this has been a pretty safe assumption, as the Roswell incident has become an integral part of American pop culture. But travel back in time to the late 1940s and early 1950s, and your friend would have assumed that you had a different destination in mind. Because long before Roswell became the most famous UFO incident, there was Aztec, the first of the crashed flying saucer stories. The gist of the Aztec tale is that in 1948, a flying saucer complete with anywhere from 14 to 18 bodies crashed in Aztec, New Mexico and recovered under cover of high secrecy by the US military. And in various formats and permutations, the tale's been circulated for the last 50 years. Some people consider it to be an outright hoax. Some people are sitting on the fence. Other people consider it to be genuine. Some people consider it maybe it's a genuine incident, but it occurred somewhere else. The timeline of Aztec uh, would be a report from the oil field workers a little after 5 a.m. on March 25th, 1948. Uh, basically, the first report came in as a large brush fire on a mesa off of Hart Canyon Road. As the oil field workers got out there, they discovered a large disk, approximately 100 feet in diameter, sitting on top of a mesa. That had nothing to do with the brush fire, but because of the oil drip tanks out there at that time, people from El Paso Oil Company were notified that they should get out there to investigate the fire and any sub subsequent danger it could pose. Upon getting out there, they noticed a large disc on the Mesa. The military showed up later that day, uh, late lunchtime, early afternoon. The uh, one local law enforcement officer had warned the locals that the military would be there eventually, that they had been notified. Aztec is a, is a fascinating uh, case because it was the original, if you will, uh, crash flying saucer story. And it surfaced uh, first in 1949 in, in uh, columns written by Frank uh, Scully in, in the, the Daily Variety. It ultimately led to a best-selling book that Scully wrote, and uh, yeah, I think it sold something on the order of 60,000 copies in 1950 in hardcover, and then it went on to... 12 editions overseas and on and on and on. I mean, it was remarkable how successful it was. It's obvious he struck some kind of real chord. It was also total nonsense. And, and Scully was either a, one of these fellows who knew enough, knew enough not to ask uh, questions he didn't want to hear the answers to, or he was genuinely duped uh, by a fellow named Silas Newton and a sidekick of his named Leo Gebauer, who became known as Dr. G in Scully's book. In Frank Scully's book, Behind the Flying Saucers, which came out in 1950, he tells the Aztec story as told by, to him by uh, Silas Newton and Leo Gebauer. Uh, Silas Newton and Leo Gebauer then introduced Frank Scully to at least eight scientists that allegedly worked on the Aztec crash. Frank Scully took these eight people and molded them into one Dr. G. The skeptics like to attack the story if they haven't researched it and say that Dr. G was Leo Gebauer. Leo Gebauer was no more uh, a scientist than anybody. He was an electrical engineer that worked with Silas Newton, uh, more of a glorified electrician, more than an electrical engineer. Frank Scully in his book plainly states that Dr. G is up to eight scientists that worked on the recovered 
UFO at Aztec. Essentially, these two guys were con men who uh, were in the process of trying to peddle a doodle bug, which is a, an oil and gas industry tag for a device that will find oil and gas, but of course doesn't. Uh, and in his case, it was a machine that not only found oil and gas, but gold and water and pretty much anything the, the uh, Mark was interested in finding. And uh, on top of that, Gebauer had invented something similar, which also supposedly could uh, assess the health of a person. So this was sort of an all-in-one, do-it-all kind of thing. But what they did, which was unusual uh, and made their little bit unique, uh, in the, was that they, they claimed that their doodle bug was better than anybody else's because it was using technology that had been taken from the flying saucer that allegedly crashed near Aztec. And therefore, obviously, it was far superior. Uh, Dr. G, our friend Gebauer, was supposedly a magnetics expert who was one of those called in by the Air Force when the saucer was tracked in, in, to ground near Aztec, uh, where it floated to ground, not actually crashed, and uh, presumably disabled by a high-powered radar somewhere nearby. That was such was the claim. Anyhow, the whole thing was a total con job. And uh, it was quickly recognized as such and, and then really exposed in detail in 1952 by uh, J.P. Kahn, who was an investigative reporter. I think he had, was with the San Francisco Examiner, if I'm not mistaken. And um, he did uh, a four or five month investigation in detail, including uh, manag managing to con the con man out of a, uh, a, an example or a sample of the mysterious metal that the saucer was made out of. It turned out to be the sort of stuff that you made pots and pans out of, actually. But, you know, he was a very, very, very sharp reporter who did a really good job. And uh, True Magazine published his article in 1952 exposing these guys. And this led to the district attorney in, um, in Denver, Colorado, prosecuting Newton and Gebauer uh, for fraud and various other sorts of associated charges. Anyway, they were convicted in December of 1952. And uh, basically the whole notion of crash flying saucers uh, went away. And people who take flying saucers, UFOs, seriously for decades wouldn't touch anything like that with a 10-foot pole until Roswell came along. I think where some of the skeptics attack uh, the, the Aztec story is why would one, two, or up to eight scientists uh, confide with Frank Scully? And that's an important question. But you have to look at who Frank Scully was back then. You have to look at how the media operated back then. We didn't have CNN. We didn't have national network TV. Uh, you had a very tight group of journalists, the Dorothy Kilgallens, the Walter Winchells, the Frank Scullys that, uh, quite frankly, were the most credible people of their, their day in journalism. And that would probably be an automatic person that you would go to to break a story like that. The other thing, if you read Frank Scully's writings, the scientists that approached him did not think that was going to be a secret for a long time. They thought that story would break within a year. They were giving Frank Scully a little advance on the Aztec incident. The first UFO-related documentary I made was a biography of legendary Roswell investigator Stanton T. Friedman. If the Aztec incident has a Friedman, that is to say, someone with respected professional credentials who has chosen to undertake a search for the truth about the UFO phenomenon, it is this man, Scott Ramsey, a successful businessman from North Carolina. Frank Scully might have broken the Aztec story, but it is Ramsey who has rescued the tale from obscurity and who has challenged, after years of research, the long-held view that the whole thing was simply a hoax. In looking at the story, that was one thing that intrigued me, was looking at the claims made back in 1950 by these eight scientists. And one was the secret radar bases. So as we started to look into the claims that Dr. G was telling Frank Scully, and we compare to what we know now, when you go back 50-some years later and look at we've, what we've been able to get declassified from the Air Force, the Atomic Energy Commission, somebody back then was definitely in the loop leaking good information to Frank Scully. It took us over, you know, 50 years now of getting records declassified to back up the claims that they were making in 1950. One was the infamous radar bases, the top secret radar bases that were located in New Mexico. We went out searching for them in 1999, 
using topographic maps on if we were to put a radar base in New Mexico, where would we put it based on height, direction, location. And uh, out of dumb luck, quite frankly, we found the first one near Albado, which is about, uh, well, I guess, air miles, probably 40 or 50 miles north of Los Alamos. We went to the Air Force, uh, Maxwell Air Force Base down in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and asked for the records on these. At the same time, the state of New Mexico was doing a historical research on anything that had anything to do with the Cold War. So this became a perfect fit. We went down to uh, kind of a dual purpose. They released the records, but we had a problem. The Air Force bases under the, or the air, radar bases under the Air Force didn't exist till 1950. Well, we couldn't tie that to Aztec because Aztec, of course, was 1948. Looking at the records in great detail, we saw things like the first quarterly report for their capital expenditures. They needed a roof. They needed a water heater. They needed some improvements in electrical work, uh, mainly some transformers. And we asked ourselves a question, if this base was just built, why would they be needing to requisition a water heater, a new roof on a building, and new transformers? So we went back and we did some digging, and uh, it turned out that the radar bases were built in 1946, which we have all the historical information on those. The Air Force did acquire the bases from 1950 to 1957, but the Atomic Energy Commission requisitioned those air, uh, the radar bases from 1946 till they turned them over to the Air Force in 1950. There were three. We had Continental Divide, which is out near Gallup, El Vado, which is uh, near Chalma, Tia Maria area, and Moriarty, which is due east of Albuquerque. That put up a perfect triangle around Kirkland Air Force Base, Sandia National Labs, and Los Alamos which was the main purpose of those radar bases, was to protect those Atomic Energy Commission installations. Ramsey, who has done a tremendous amount of research on, on Aztec, he found these places, you know, the, if you look at the history of the Air Defense Command and the setup of the Lash-Up radar system, which was the beginning of our whole Continental Air Defense radar system and all of that, there were no Air Defense Command radars at those sites at the time of the alleged crash saucer incident. But he found out that there were radars there, and they were under the control of the Atomic Energy Commission. They had something, whatever, something to do with some sort of vague, feeble attempt to, to provide for defense against air attack at Los Alamos, the national lab, the bomb lab. Um, as far as the rest of New Mexico is concerned, there just weren't any such radars. You know, they had them at White Sands. They had radars at White Sands for tracking uh, captured V2s that they were launching down there and other things of that sort. But those were, again, these were World War II retreads, essentially. There was nothing exotic. What Just, kind of people did they have serving here? If you, is, these because it looks like a short straw kind of gig for me. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought when I first saw it. I thought, my God, you really had to do some, something wrong to get here. But boy, you look at the reports, these guys were the cream of the crop. You know, the three, uh, three bases, they really, wow. they had some pretty, pretty impressive resumes, let's put it that way. We looked into the type of radar that they were using at these three installations, and especially Alvada had a very, very powerful radar. It was an experimental radar for the U.S. Navy. It was a high microwave, which all radars are. They all work on some form of uh, signal microwave. This one was extremely powerful, and we even have the manuals telling the operators the do's and don'ts if aircraft were in the area. Keeping in mind that was a restricted airspace back in those days. This is the old uh, power generation building. They had uh, five diesel generators in here. They would, they would pump the uh, kerosene, the diesel fuel in here through the pump station, the pump house right there. And uh, this was backup. These radar units took a lot, of, a lot of electricity to run. And these were backups. You can see from the slabs here, there were five. Then all the switch gear and all the cabling that would drop down and go over to the, the bunker next door. So that's the bunker over there, is it? That's the main radar. Let's go take a look at that. Sure. So this is a pretty powerful radar we're talking about. Oh, yeah. 
when the Air Force took it over, it became the Tia Amaria. And then later on in life, El Vado. Yeah. You ready to go in there? Sure, let's, uh, let's take a look. Yeah. You're not afraid of bats, are you? Well, I don't want to get bitten by one. Yep, this is it right here. Probably won't want to go back in there. Probably not. I guarantee, I guarantee you don't. And some people speculate that the, uh, the radar here was powerful enough to uh, interfere somehow with an alien spacecraft. That's, that's a theory. And might have brought it down. Mm -hmm. And they would have had similar radar stations, I assume, down by Roswell. They had one in uh, Corona. And uh, if you read the historical reports we were going through last night, they also had one down at Walker, which was Roswell. Right, right. Coincidence? Yeah, maybe. Huh? If these guys came flying across millions upon millions of miles of space, if, if they flew from, or billions, if they came from another star and a planet around another star, is it likely that they wouldn't be shielded against the kind of feeble radiation that would be coming out of our radar sets? I mean, how likely is it that they would have forgotten about that particular part of the spectrum? <laughs> and then they, come, they get here and they get shot out of the sky. And people are saying, oh, they're dropping out of the skies. What is all this business? How could a sophisticated craft from far away crash. You know, we had two shuttles go, too. Very sophisticated craft. I think they may have run into the unexpected, whether it was a radar beam or all kinds of other things. Uh, accidents happen. That's the way it is. And uh, I think if you look at the mothership descriptions, these huge monster UFOs, if you will, which are seen to have little ones going in and out of them, one big vehicle could carry a whole bunch of these little vehicles. And if they lose one, they lose one. Okay. Explorers, Magellan didn't make it around the planet. Uh, his ship made it. He didn't make it. I think that Scott Ramsey has been a forerunner in this and has done some excellent research. When he started, there were a lot more skeptics than there are today. There were a lot of people who said they were crazy, that this was just a scam, there was nothing to it. And he's proved that there were radar sites, secret radar bases, that were sending out microwave rays, um, microwave beams that, that could have knocked a flying saucer out of the sky and caused it to crash land north of Aztec. And he's proved that fact. So that gives it a, a little bit more of a validity to me, that there's some truth to these theories when you start getting the, the government documents in your hand. Another intriguing fact is that the FBI file on Leo Jabara, which has been declassified, the entire file runs for 400 pages, of which only 200 have been declassified. And many of the documents contained within the withheld material are classified for reasons affecting national security and the defense of the USA. Now, it's one thing for someone to be arrested and convicted for uh, scams and cons and things like this, but it's a big leap for someone to be a con artist then to find that the FBI considers them a threat to national security. And so this sort of begs the question, do the withheld documents contain far more on the Aztec case than has been published and put into the public domain by the FBI? I think the fact that those files are still classified might be the result of two quite different things. One is that they really were involved in some stuff and had some information that for whatever reason they agreed not to talk about, but the FBI pressured them and so forth. That's certainly a possibility. Another is the general FBI attitude, the old J. Edgar Hoover attitude about keeping track of people and getting files and you know having power over them. And I don't know which it was. Uh, Newton was sharp, no question about that. Whether he stumbled across some things that he shouldn't have stumbled across, I don't know. A number of FBI documents make it very clear that the FBI and the Air Force at the time were following Newton and Jabeur very, very closely and were literally listening on their every word, were going out to conferences and lectures that both men were speaking at and wanting to know what the truth was behind the Aztec case. 
uh, was it a genuine incident or was it simply a concoction of these two enterprising con men? It's possible there's something in there that would, would uh, bear on this and give us some answers and, and maybe they would prefer for reasons which may or may not be legitimate uh, to keep that quiet. Certainly we can't say, oh, this is real because these con men told this story. But because con men told the story about Aztec doesn't mean that there wasn't an Aztec story to be told. A g genuine one, a legitimate one. You have to be real careful about this guilt by association, or genuineness by association for that matter. Con men, government cover-ups, conflicting stories. If there was a theme song for the investigation of the UFO phenomenon, it might well be the Beatles, The Long and Winding Road. The Aztec case is the perfect example of this, both figuratively and literally in the case of Hart Canyon Road, which leads to the alleged crash site. In looking at the story, uh, one of the things that's come under scrutiny is the fact that the skeptics on the Aztec incident claim that the Hart Canyon Road did not exist in 1948. Uh, we know it did now. That would have been the stagecoach road back in the late 1800s on the way to Durango. If you go out to the crash site today, follow Hart Canyon on the old stagecoach route, you come up to what they call the Arkansas Loop or the Arkansas Bend. And on top of that plateau is a road cut through, allegedly by the military in 1948 to get the recovery equipment, the cranes and whatnot, down in there to retrieve the craft. So this is the mystery road? This is the mystery road. Tell me about the mystery road. Well, this road, and unless it shows up on recent maps, has never shown up anywhere. Right. This is the road the uh, military, or whoever the recovery operation was, allegedly cut uh, to get back here to retrieve the craft. OK. And this was in March 48. That's right. And this road, now most of the roads around here, you were telling me, uh, it's oil roads and stuff like that. They, yep. They're marked on the maps, the USGA maps, is it? USGS, yeah. Right. Um, and this road wasn't marked on any of those maps until, if it is marked at all, until recently. Very recently, right. So we've got a mystery road. Yep. And over here, we've got a mystery cement block. Concrete pad. Now well, let's go take a look at that then. Very good. Tell me the story behind the mystery slab of concrete. Well, it really makes no sense why it's even here. It's uh, on the average nine and a half inches thick. We did a core sample right at about a year ago. What we're trying to establish is how old the slab is. Sure. Does it fit into the time frame of 1948? We've got rebar heavily fortified, you know, nine and a half inches thick, rebar all through it. Uh, early skeptics said it was a well cap. We've rolled that out. Obviously, if we had drilled through it, uh, through the concrete, if there was high pressure natural gas under there, we'd know it. So that's what they say. The skeptics said a well yeah. cap for natural gas. That's right. And there is gas and oil around here. Yeah, all over. Yeah. yeah. But not on, not, a, not on a mesa that's bedrock. And you go a few feet under the silt, and you're going to hit bedrock. OK. The uh, grouting is of local, local it's indigenous to the, the area. So they didn't truck it in. They just kind of got it. They just used what was lying around here. So if you're coming down the road, you're in a, you know, chop, chop, you're in a hurry, cutting a quick road, uh, something's happening real quick, you know, you just pull what you can find That's right. from the local area, okay? Bring your Portland cement and your forms and rebar and be done with it. Now, what's it doing here, though? Why, if, 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 if there was a crash site and all of this, you know, what is this? When they cut the road, as you can see to this day, it's very silty. They had trouble with one of the crane arm supports, one of the legs of the crane. And the story goes, they had to pour this because the leg would just keep going into the silt, which, as you can see around here, is still a problem. Sure. I mean, if you just, you can just walk over here and uh, yep. take a look at the, take a look at the silt. I wouldn't want to put a crane on that. Nope. Um, all right. So you got a mystery road. Yep. You got a mystery slab. Roads allegedly cut by the military to come in here. Crane slabs allegedly put here uh, to support, uh, or the slabs allegedly put here to support a crane. Yep. What's the crane recovering? Allegedly. A flying disc, allegedly. A, a flying disc. Now, where's the flying disc? All right. Well, we don't know where it is now, but where was it back then, allegedly? About 200 yards straight through. Well, let's go take a look. Works for me. Watch your footing. Yeah. Get out of the 
any snakes around here? Nah, not this time here. The recovery group that uh, was sent out to Aztec was a, a, a hybrid recovery that had been formed after the Roswell incident uh, because the Roswell incident had been so badly botched with a news release. Uh, basically, a lot of people at the base being aware of it, the newspaper running an article. And after the Roswell incident, this newly recovery group was formed. This would have been a very, very elite group, uh, so they would never have a, another Roswell incident where they had some young guys at a base, even though the 509th was a top-notch base with top-notch people. It was eight months later, and you know, Roswell kind of got botched, the news release, the press release. And uh, the old-timer I talked to that was in air intelligence said that we were dealing with a much more mature crowd back then, late 30s, early 40s, so they would never have the... Uh... They'd never have another Roswell. Yeah, Press releases exactly. going out, young PR officers and that sort of thing. Right. This was one of the best recoveries they had done to date. I think Aztec is certainly part of the cover-up. I think after Roswell, they got much better at covering things up, making sure that they monitored flights of vehicles so that they would get there first, remembering that New Mexico is not highly populated. I mean, today it's less than maybe two million people in the fifth largest state, mind you. Um, I think that the government made it a strong policy. They set up MJ-12, and they put the clamps on. And part of the keeping secrets is to lie and misrepresent and misdirect. a standard practice. You know, again, uh, New Mexico, when the first atom bomb was exploded, July uh, 16th, 1945. Uh, it was seen from 100 miles away. It was a pretty big bang. Uh, there were articles in the newspaper. Ammunition dump blows up. Nobody injured, fortunately. I've got some of those articles. They got good at covering things up. What we feel, based on all the reports, this would be the epicenter of the crash site right here. It was, it was virtually intact. Right. So was it a soft landing? Was it a crash? We don't know. Now, there's a plaque over here. So That's this right. is a commemorative plaque of the... Of the alleged the incident. Recovery at Heart Canyon. On or about this site on March 25th, 1948, the spacecraft of origins unknown crash landed on this mesa. The 767th A&W radar base in nearby El Vado New Mexico tracked the errant landing to this site. High security recovery operation took approximately two weeks with all remains being taken to Los Alamos, New Mexico, for scientific study and evaluation by some of the world's leading scientists. And Los Alamos is what, two hours from here? Two and a half? Yeah, about 127 miles as the crow flies. Sure. The recovery of this craft by the U.S. government and military was one of the most secretive recoveries of spacecraft with origins unknown since the similar recovery in Roswell, New Mexico, eight months earlier. Sadly, all occupants, as many as 16, died as the result of this crash, making full disclosure of both purpose and or origination all but impossible. That was put here in 1999. Three years after the symposium started. Uh, one year. One, oh, right. Yeah, yeah one year. 98 was the first year. Right. So this is it. Not much to look at, but no, who, not really. who knows what happened here. A lot of twisted dead trees. A lot of broken off trees and a big open space that uh, about 35 feet wide, 110 feet long. And the only question is, what crashed here? Did anything crash here? Yeah. All right. I love visiting New Mexico, not just because I'm interested in the UFO phenomenon, but because its vast, empty spaces are so different so alien, one might say, to my home, Halifax, Nova Scotia, a bustling cosmopolitan seaport on Canada's east coast. Out here, I sometimes feel that I'm at the edge of the world. And yet, there are similarities between New Mexico and Nova Scotia. Friendly people, for example, that might not be readily apparent, but which do exist. These common elements are also present in the Roswell and Aztec UFO incidents no matter how much the skeptics might tell you otherwise. Let's do a comparison of Roswell and Aztec. 
Roswell made the front page of many, many newspapers across the country. We had an intelligence officer who was given the release to go ahead and release the information to the press, later retracting it the next day. Aztec, we may have one newspaper article that made it out that has conveniently disappeared out of the archives. You hear the argument, we don't have eyewitnesses at Aztec. Well, we didn't have eyewitnesses four or five years ago. We have eyewitnesses now. Unfortunately, some are deceased. One key eyewitness that we had, and he's deceased now, was Doug Nolan. Uh, grew up in the Four Corners area. At 19 years of age, worked for the El Paso Oil Company. Was in his truck that day that over the radio, they had an old Motorola radio in the truck, uh, traveling with his boss, Bill Ferguson. They were called on the radio to get out to Hart Canyon because of the brush fire, the infamous brush fire we hear about. Upon uh, arriving at the crash site, uh, they were told by other workers the brush fires on one side. They were worried about a drip tank uh, getting ignited in the brush fire. Upon arrival there, other oil field workers told them that it's not the brush fire you got to see. You got to see what's laying up on the mesa. Doug went on to tell us all the locals that were there, the police, the two police officers that were there, his boss, Bill Ferguson, who's probably deceased, although we were still looking for him. I had the luxury of interviewing Doug back uh, that October of 2003, and he passed away December 7th. And then we have an eyewitness. We have a deathbed confession. Doug had had six strokes from June until October. Uh, he was very slow and methodical in recalling the incident and appeared to be very credible in the interview. In the late uh, 90s, early 2000s, we were contacted by a gentleman, Ken Farley, from Bat Cave, Arizona. And Ken uh, wanted to talk to us. He was in very bad health. Randy Barnes and I met down in uh, Phoenix, rented a car, drove up, interviewed Ken for probably three hours, took very good notes. Ken was uh, very ill, on oxygen. He has since passed away. Ken told his side of the story that uh, he was in Durango, passing through to San Diego, fresh out of the military. Met a friend in uh, Cedar Hill, a drop-off point where he was to pick him up and keep traveling to San Diego. His friend told him there was a lot of commotion going on out on Hart Canyon Road and they thought an aircraft had gone down. Ken and his friend uh, got to the crash site and walked out to the western side of where the disc was. And at that point, a group of people from Aztec, the oil field people, uh, two law enforcement officers showed up, who were already actually at the scene. And uh, we found Ken's story believable, but we had a hard time digesting the two police officers. We figured today if you were out there and you called 911, you'd be lucky to get one in a reasonable time frame. No, no disrespect to the local law enforcement, but it's out in the middle of nowhere. And the fact that there's two police officers out there, we had a little bit of a problem with. We didn't write off his interview. We kind of parked it over in the, the holding pen until we got uh, more eyewitnesses. And then in 2003, we, were, we contacted Doug Nolan, who had contacted Bill Steinman. It was one of the leftover leads Bill never got to after the book was published. Doug told an interesting story, which was very believable, backed up with names of other local residents. But about three quarters of the way through the interview, he mentions the other police officer. And I stopped Doug and I said, what other police officer? He said, well, we had the local police officer and then another gentleman, young guy. Well, Doug was 19 at the time and said that police officer was about his age, slightly older. That police officer didn't seem to intermingle with the locals. So Doug went over and talked to him, and he said he was from the town of Cuba, New Mexico, which is southeast of, of Aztec. That police officer claimed he had followed the craft that night up what is now 550, the old Highway 44. 
We dug into the details as best. Doug, again, was dying. He had had six strokes since past June. Doug also said uh, he was going through who was at the crash site that day. He could remember all but two people because he didn't know who they were. And I asked him who, and he said two young guys, maybe three, that stood at the western side of the crash site. At that point, that tied in Ken Farley's story, also backing up his claim about the two police officers. So we had stories that were now starting to connect with witnesses. In the winter of 2002, I was contacted by Glenn Pace. Glenn Pace was uh, born and raised in the Farmington area. Uh, subsequently, he was interviewed uh, extensively by Linda Moulton Howe. Told a very interesting story as a young man delivering papers uh, a day or two after the Aztec crash. Back then, the local paper was called The Hustler. That's since then, uh, since then, it's now the Farmington Daily Times. Glenn recalls delivering papers with an article on the cover of The Hustler referring to ranchers find disc on ranch in Hart Canyon Road. At that time, that is one of a few years of The Hustler, there is no archived microfiche on. Years later, Glenn Pace was working down at White Sands uh, Missile Range, now White Sands uh, Proving Ground, and uh, worked with Otto Krauss, who was a very well-known scientist of his day, but passed away in the early 90s. And Otto Krauss asked him where he was from, and when Glenn said the Farmington area, night after night of working out on the test range, they got to know each other pretty well. And Otto said that he was uh, somehow involved in the Aztec UFO recovery. And doing research and looking into Otto Krauss's background, I believe he would have been somebody you would have included in that. He was a very brilliant man of his day. Uh, Otto made reference to Glenn that the Aztec recovery was one of the best ones the military had done. Again, using words close to, we didn't botch it like we did in Roswell. March 27th of uh, 1999, I was contacted indirectly by Fred Reed. He had contacted the Daily Times and the Aztec Public Library and uh, sent a very nice letter. He had attended the uh, 97 symposium. And I uh, subsequently sat down on the phone and talked to Fred for, for quite a long time. In 1948, he worked for the OSS, predecessor to uh, the CIA. And Fred and his crew was dispatched to the Aztec crash site. Uh, after the craft uh, was removed, matter of fact, there was no discussion of a, a, a UFO or a flying disc. They were told to go out and do a final cleanup of the site and to absolutely map and survey with great precision the entire area. And when talking to Fred, I asked Fred, well, what were your thoughts? What, do you, what did you think when you and your crew got here? And he said, actually, we thought a plane had crashed, which would make sense with all the air traffic uh, over the state of New Mexico military at that time. Uh, he described the Mesa back then, having just been there a couple days before, looking back to 1948, that there had been large equipment out there, which they were told to not really re-landscape, but kind of retexture, get rid of all the, the heavy equipment tracks, uh, clean up anything left behind, K ration cans, whatnot, which, by the way, later we did find some 18 inches down in the soil. Map the entire area, make sure a cleanup uh, was well done, nothing left behind, and uh, move on which was not unusual for uh, his group in the OSS. Years later, uh, Fred was talking to some senior officers on what happened out at Aztec, and it was eluded that it was a rather large flying disc. They never came out and said that. It was a gentleman he befriended that was senior to him. But uh, interesting, that's, uh, they were actually sent out to do a cleanup, and. Uh, some of the interesting things that uh, Fred uh, enlightened us with, we've always had a question of the cut-in road, the mystery road, and the concrete slab 
And uh, Fred said in 1948 it was quite evident that that was a fresh cut road. And the concrete slab, which again was used to uh, aid a crane leg, support leg, to get some object off the mason. Fred and I made a, uh, a date to sit down and have lunch and go over his service records and kind of go into the story a little bit more. And unfortunately, he died of a massive heart attack about a month later. He died in March of that year. I'm sorry, excuse me, April of that year. A lot of skeptical people will, will come up to me and others and say things like, well, you know, do you really think that the government or any government could hide something as monumental as aliens for 50 years. You know, you give them too much credit. They're not that good. Our governments are not that smart. They, they can't keep a secret. You hear this all the time. Uh, I think that's, that's utter nonsense. Um, I think to ask this question betrays a real lack of understanding about how secrecy operates. For instance, to answer the question, can, can such a secret be kept? The true answer is yes and no. It's really both. Uh, it is yes, first of all, in the sense that secrecy protocols within the military in particular are extreme. Penalties are extreme. Um, you sign away your constitutional rights in many cases when you are exposed to very, very sensitive classified information. And uh, in many cases, this is binding for life. So it's not that easy to just to go talking about what you've experienced. Uh, but the answer, in a sense, is no, in, in the sense that leaks do occur. Leaks have always occurred regarding UFOs, uh, right from the late 40s right on through to the present day. Stuff gets out. That is true. However, um, the real issue is if you're trying to manage this problem and you're trying to control the UFO problem, uh, th the real problem becomes not to slam that lid down 100% because that's, that is impossible. The real issue, it seems to me, is to neutralize or make useless information that does come out. How do you do that? One of the good witnesses that we've uh, located who wishes to uh, remain anonymous is a gentleman that I divulged to you. And uh, he was not at the crash site, uh, but worked behind the scenes out of the Ro Roswell Army Airfield. Basically, his job was to review personnel records of the up to 200 people that worked on the recovery and uh, to make sure that their personnel files would not reflect that they were at the crash site. In other words, making sure that if years down the road somebody made that claim that they could uh, show through their personnel files that they were nowhere near the area. Like the Jesse Marcel case of Roswell, uh, this individual didn't find us, we found him. Apparently, a lot of the uh, UFO reports that were not going to Blue Book, that were going to this uh, Air Force Intel, were going to him. And as luck would have it, when we found him, he was still alive and was up until a few months back. The skeptics maintain that this is all hooey, that you could never keep a flying saucer crash secret, that someone, whether on the recovery team or a civilian witness, would talk about something as big as Roswell or Aztec. But would they? And if they tried, who would really be listening? One of the most intriguing ones I investigated occurred in early 1964 and involved the recovery of a small triangular shaped object from a, a Midlands forest. And in this particular case, um, I tracked down various witnesses who recalled seeing military cordons and police cordons turning people away from the area. Uh, one witness who stood out more than any other um, literally stumbled upon the recovery scene of this object which was being loaded aboard a military transport vehicle and he was treated quite roughly by the military, had his camera and film confiscated and was warned not to talk about this incident. This was February 1964 and he spoke to me in September 1996 and when myself and a colleague went to interview him um, he'd had this, just before we arrived, he'd had this rather bizarre and kind of threatening telephone call from the Ministry of Defence ordering him as a civilian not to talk to us about this particular case. And it did put him off speaking. He was quite frightened by it all. And, of course, we hear accounts like this very often within the UFO subject, and you need to investigate each one on its own merit. Um, what we did, we, through various checks and... Um, 
things like this, we were able to determine that he had indeed received a telephone call from the Ministry of Defence, one specific branch called the Ministry of Defence Guard Service. Now, this man is now in his 70s and he's a, just a retired washing machine repairer um, living on his own in a small apartment and he gets a phone call from the Ministry of Defence Police at 9 o'clock in the morning warning him not to talk about an incident that he was involved in 40 years previously. And fortunately, we were able to verify the incoming details of this telephone call to, to confirm that he did receive it. And so this kind of begs the question, what kind of incident could be of paramount importance to the British Ministry of Defence that 40 years after it occurred, someone is still keeping watch on the people who were involved in the case to the extent that they're being told not to talk to civilian UFO researchers. And the fact that we arranged the interview by telephone, then that sort of brings up all sort of other scenarios about telephone monitoring operations uh, to keep this story under wraps. And as, as sceptical as I was when I first got into the subject, um, even for me now, you know, I've had events and occurrences like this happen so many times that, you know, I, I'm, I believe there is a concerted effort on the part of a, a covert organisation buried incredibly well within, within the intelligence community to keep watch on the more sensitive and sensational aspects of the UFO subject. I think there really was a crash there. I think that uh, Scott has gathered a lot of witnesses. I think we've got more to find. And of course, we're racing the undertaker and losing the race most of the time. Several important witnesses have died within the past year. I personally think that New Mexico would have been a prime target for any alien visitors. I mean, I make one assumption about all civilizations out there, as well as here for that matter, that they're concerned about their own survival and security. That seems to be a natural part of the development of any advanced civilization. Okay, that being the case, you have to keep tabs on the primitives in the neighborhood. But only close tabs, frequent visitations, detailed investigations, when they show signs of being able to bother you. At the end of World War II, there were three signs that soon these idiot earthlings, this primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare, we don't look far to see that it's still that way, we don't need to look far for that, would be moving out, soon meaning a hundred years, which on a cosmic time scale is nothing. The three signs were clearly nuclear weapons, you measure the radiation in the atmosphere, it's easy to find, V2 rockets, which obviously weren't being used to carry mail back and forth between Germany and England, and powerful electronics, radar systems in particular, which suddenly appeared on this planet. It used to be AM radio, which sticks around the planet, and now suddenly you've got radar beams that go outside. We're obviously moving along with development of electronic systems. I don't think it's any coincidence at all that the only place on the planet where you could check out all three of these technologies in 1947 and 48 was southeastern New Mexico. That's where the first atom bomb was tested, Trinity site on uh, Alamogordo Army Airfield, White Sands Proving Ground, if you want to call it that. Uh, the V-2 rockets were all being tested there that we had captured from the Germans, and we were modifying some to go up much higher and things like that. And that's where we had our best radar to track the rockets, which sometimes went south instead of north, even though they were supposed to go north. Uh, I would be flabbergasted if aliens weren't checking out the place. So, New Mexico would have been a natural place for aliens to visit. But Roswell and Aztec remain controversial at best. Is there a related UFO incident that even the skeptics can accept as real? As it happens, there is and it occurred just a few miles from Aztec in Farmington, New Mexico. The, uh, the, the Farmington Armada case is a, is a classic in ufology. Uh, in, in March of 1950, a large number of people in Farmington, New Mexico, which at that time was a lot smaller than it is now, I mean, dramatically smaller. I think now it's about 30,000, and we're dealing in those days with maybe uh, 3,000 people, if that. In any case, they, what they saw were literally hundreds of objects uh, circling in the sky and zooming back and forth in formation, and uh, most people describing them as being shaped like dinner plates, classic flying saucers, uh, including one that was bright red. All the others were silvery. And the bright red one, red one is interesting particularly because 
as it led a group of these of saucers away from Farmington uh, to the off to the southeast, roughly almost actually more due east, but just a little south of that. Uh, a few minutes later, before any of this could hit the news wires or be on the radio anywhere in Las Vegas, New Mexico, a group of uh, of uh, postal workers were outside taking a break or something and looked up and saw a group of saucers whizzing over and one of them was bright red. Uh, I think these people were actually did see, indeed, you know, who knows, was this a rendezvous point where they all dropping down from the mothership and then heading out to the four points of the compass or what they were doing, I don't know. But I think they really did see something quite real. The Farmington Armada, which involved lots of people seeing lots of stuff up there, lots of vehicles, if you will, half the town, I guess, saw these things. Uh, Dr. James E. MacDonald uh, did a detailed investigation, found loads of people who'd seen things. Maybe that was the gathering place. I don't know. Four Corners area there? Who knows why they were there? I mean, who knows why people picnic in a certain area? You know, I don't know. And it may be a staging area. Okay, you guys check out the nuclear weapon sites over there. And remember, pretty soon we were building nuclear weapon, testing nuclear weapons in Nevada, which is the other way from Farmington toward Roswell in the other direction. Uh... They had a great gathering laying out their, their plans for further reconnaissance. And it was taken seriously by the Farmington Daily Times, as you can see by this headline, which ran on Saturday, March 18th of 1950, Huge Saucer Armada Jolts Farmington. There were several witnesses to the event, and Lincoln O'Brien, the publisher of the paper, actually sent a telegram by Western Union to Ken Purdy of the True Magazine, Whole City, Farmington, New Mexico, where we own daily, sees large forest flying saucers, airmailing you full reports, story terrific, not fully developed. If you want to send man to Farmington, we will assist him in every way. So it was taken seriously at that time, and I think that that was probably because there had been so many connections to UFOs in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And there are some people who believe that this saucer armada was actually connected to the crash at Roswell and at Aztec. We had the crash at Roswell in 47, the crash in Aztec in 48, and then the flyover in 1950. And several people believe that the saucers flew over in formation as a salute to their fallen comrades, because it did happen in March, the same month that the Aztec crash was reported to have happened. So, crash site here, we've already been up there, saucers came in, which direction allegedly? The story says from that direction, over Bloomfield Blanco, right. came right through this tree line right here where all the trees are damaged and twisted, and came to rest right in here, down in here. So there it is the Aztec UFO incident, the first of the crashed flying saucer tales. But is it a fraud perpetrated by a couple of clever con men on an unwitting journalist, or is it part of the greatest of all government conspiracies? The truth, as so often seems to be the case in the UFO field, remains a mystery. It is up to you to judge the evidence. I'll give the final word, however, to Scott Ramsey, the man most responsible for bringing that evidence to light once again. In, in concluding with the Aztec incident, you, you have to look at, uh, I think we certainly have, uh, look at the original story, look at what the skeptics have to say. Take the original information that Skelly published in 1950, uh, which we've done, and then digest it from there. And I think we've, we've proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that somebody with incredibly good insider information was telling Frank Scully a story. We've got a lot more research uh, to do on the Aztec incident, uh, there's no doubt. If our research shows that uh, Aztec was a tall story that got out of control, we'll, we'll be the first ones to come forward and, and say that. Uh, but until then, it's an open case, it's an open mystery, and we're going to keep going on it.